shops, fintechs, as well as banks, are changing the financial landscape. One innovation at a time. In 2020, fintechs acquired over $25.6 billion in investments and transaction value of digital payments through the over $5.2 trillion globally. Banks are also not left out. At the forefront is Echo Bank, championing a pan African expansion through its industry leading payment infrastructure, promoting partnerships open banking sandbox and APIs whilst facilitating intercontinental trade through its network spanning 33 African countries and business outlays across Europe, America, and Asia. Today, financial services is about the experience and not the products. And the future of finance is collaboration, not competition. This is why it is important for banks and fintechs to come together to foster a stronger ecosystem. Because we are better together as partners, presenting Echo Bank FinTech Breakfast Series, partnering for a stronger ecosystem. More than ever. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the EcoBank Breakfast Series. My name is Cora Manekoroye, and I'm going to be your host and moderator for this morning. Um, I am Tekabal's managing editor and acting editor in chief. Tekabal is a media publication, a pan African media publication focused on bringing um, comprehensive business and technology news about. Africa, we're talking about how Africans are using technology to manage their lives, to work, to function around the continent. Um, before we get into the swing of things, I believe we're going to get a welcome address from Mr. Bola Jilawal. Keep going. Okay, he's not here yet. Okay, so let's just get familiar and friendly with each other. Thank you. So I will talk a little bit about the breakfast series and why we're here this morning. The EcoBank breakfast series is focused on bringing together leaders from the fintech industry to discuss topics pertinent to the fintech ecosystem, such as regulatory guidelines, funding, partnerships, and other areas of interest to fintechs at different stages of their journey. So that means whether they're an early stage startup, scale up, or they're on their way to becoming an enterprise company. This series is brought to you in partnership, um, is brought to you by Echo Bank in partnership with Techabal. Okay, um, so today we're going to be using a tool called Slido to help us with our Q&A session. So we're going to test this out now. So I want everyone who has their phone with them or their iPad or any device with them to go into www.slido.com. Oh, there it is up there. S-L-I-D-O.com. It's super easy to use. We just want to walk through how it's going to work. Um, so every question that you have for any of the panelists or myself, you are going to have to send it through Slido. So once you get into Slido, you will see a, a little box that allows you to put in that code, hashtag EcoBank BFSS. So let's give it a go. Let's take a few minutes there. I want to get ourselves familiar with it. And Slido can be used by those online as well and um, folks here in person. Okay, great. I guess one of the questions is up already, right? Yes. Okay. Um, so when you put in the code, you should be able to see a page that has Q&A and polls. We're going to test it out. Um, there's a poll up right now. How many African countries is Echo Bank present in? So if you're there, please just tap the option. Your responses will come in as anonymous, so 
Please don't be shy if you get it wrong. <laughs> Nobody's gonna know. <laughs> Okay, we're still seeing some responses coming in. If you're having any issues with Slido, please let us know. We'll help you out with that. Okay, so the answer to this question is 35. So well done to 53%. Okay, what is going on? The answer is 35. Um, so we're gonna put up another question on the poll. Okay, so we have one up here. Which of the following best describes you? So as you are in the room, please select. Okay, so... All right, so we're going to bring up Mr. Bola Jilawal to just come and address us this morning. Oh, you're there. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, I think I should give you this mic. Yes, please. So good morning, everyone. Um, and welcome to EcoBank once again. Um, we're here, and uh, one of our objectives behind this session is to see how we can work together as um, players, as banks, as fintechs, and as um, uh, service providers to see how we can deepen the ecosystem within Nigeria, as well as in Sub-Saharan Africa. If you agree with me, every forward-looking company today okay. must be a technology-first company. Okay. And how can we use technology to change our environment? How can we use technology to deepen payments in sub-Saharan Africa. And we see so many problems across the country. Um, we're all a bit frustrated about what's happening in our environment. But there's so many bright people in the country today. And if we all come together and collaborate, we can make the environment better. And this perspective of doing it all on your own can no longer solve problems in Nigeria as well as in Africa. So we don't have all the answers here, but we'd like to listen to everybody. We'd like to learn, we'd like to see how we can collaborate to grow the economy for the benefit of all the players. So this is not about EcoBank, it's about all of us. And I see familiar faces here, I see friends and I see leading players within our business environment. So what we want to just do is to listen to all of you, to learn, to share ideas, and hopefully something good can come out of all of this. So welcome to EcoBank, welcome to this session, and I look forward to enjoy, engaging and learning from all of you. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, if it's okay, I would like us to test asking questions. So let's go back to Slido and um, please tap Q&A and type a question that you'd like me to answer. Um, Slido also allows you to upvote. You see a thumbs up symbol next to a question. So as many questions come in, if you see a question you'd like answered, please upvote it, right? So if a question has a lot of upvotes, I'll answer it. So let's see if we can get some questions in. They don't have to be serious questions, by the way. You can ask something fun. You know, you can ask me what my favorite color is. I'll be happy to answer. Okay, I like this question. Please ask another question that is not about fintech, please. We're gonna be talking about fintech today. How, oh, oh who, who wants to know this? No, we, we don't answer that question. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, you have to hold somebody at the back for that. Um, okay. Wow, this one has the most, 
Wow. Okay, I guess I'll answer. I am 31 years old. Okay, for the food I'm asking. And um, okay, let's see. Which other one has? I, I don't know the answer to this question. I think Mr. Bola Gilawa can answer this one. Where am I from? I can answer this one. I'm from Bielsa State. I'm an Ijo woman. Yeah, so that's the answer to that. Okay, I think we have a hang of it. So we can get ready for our first session. Um, this session will be moderated by Daniel Adeyemi. Daniel Adeyemi is a senior reporter at Techabal. He's been with us for a really long time and I'm really looking forward to hearing him moderate this session. Um, in this session, we're going to be talking about partnerships Right. Um, partnerships are important for both fintechs and banks, right? Fintech banks and banks in some ways need fintechs as well. Um, but, you know, both fintechs and banks have different goals when they're going into collaborations and partnerships. And it's important that the goals and responsibilities and expectations are clearly spelled out, as it would be with any partnership. In our first session, we'll be looking at what it takes to achieve a win-win situation when it comes to partnerships, what early stage fintechs need to know about partnering with banks, right, and even selecting the right bank to partner with. What goes into that? What do you need to consider before you go to your bank, to go, before you go to a bank and ask them to come into partnership with you? And we're also going to look at what, what banks are looking for in fintechs that they want to partner with. Daniel will be speaking with Isaac Kamuta, Tomilola Majekodumi, Daniel Ahusa, and Benga Ajayi. If you have any questions, please remember to send them through Slido, and then we'll take it from there. So Daniel, please come up. I believe Tomilola is here. Mr. Benga Ajayi is here. Um, I think Daniel is online and Isaac Kamuta, right? We're good? Yeah. Okay, All right. Thank you very much, Permane. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Yeah, so I'd just like to invite the um, panels, panelists of, to come up stage. Uh, Tomi, Tomlala Maja Kudumi. Um, I think she's here. Yes, yes. Hi, Tomi. Uh, please let's put our hands together. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, Mr. Kenga Ajayi. Let's put our hands together. And of course, Mr. Isaac Kamuta. All right, so thank you everyone. It's good to be here. So we're just going to get right to it. So the speakers here are going to go into a seven minute session where they just give their, share their thoughts on what it's like, you know, bank fintech collaboration. And, you know, as she said, while they are speaking, whether you're here in the audience or you're online, you can still drop, your, drop in your questions. So I'd like to start with Tommy, right? CEO of Bankly. She's going to start by sharing her thoughts. Um, all right. Awesome man that taught me right. Good morning. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Bola Dilawal. It's a pleasure to see you here. And thanks, Tech about. Um, I'm going to talk, go straight into talking about uh, bank and fintech uh, collaboration. I think it's, I dare say, you know, I'm, I'll boldly say that without um, such partnerships, I won't be sitting here today without such partnership, nothing like a uh, the real parent name of Bankly, Triple Five for Technologies, would exist. Now we started out um, through research, and so when we research and realized that we want to specifically target the 38 million unbanked that someone uh, posted up before, we knew that we needed to pilot it. We weren't going to just dive into the water and swim. Now there's an article by Tech about I think it's important that we anyone who wants to look deeply into it should go look into it. It said that there are five types of partnership relationship that um, a fintech and bank can go into. And I would just list the five types and see and show how Bankly had played a role or where could be 
or which part of it we've played a role. The first one, obviously, is partnership for regulatory compliance. Now, this is critical because you want to, in using the lean model, you want to test out. I like to say that I'm a scientist at art, so I had to use the hypothesis testing model. So I had to say, this is the hypothesis question. Now, what am I going to see in the market? Getting a, the, the right uh, regulatory um, license at the time when you're still testing, you don't even know what this is. You don't even know what specific license it will evolve into. And licensing takes time. So one of the things we did was to approach a bank and said, this is what we are attempting to do. And this is the value for you. There has to, it has to be symbiotic. So we said, this is the value for you. And this is how we would play in sharing the results that we, we got. Now in that relationship, of course, we wanted to move quickly into the market. The bank who knew that we will be agile in moving quickly into the market and the hunger, they could leverage it to understand what, what's possible in this space. Now they could also, they were quite uh, regulatory, uh, um, they were, they are regulated, so they could be almost like a regulatory sandbox, more like holding our hands and telling us, this is what you are allowed to do, this is what you are not allowed to do. And when it's time to answer to the regulators, they are able to be the buffer to say, oh, this is what we've allowed them to do. And that was what saved us. And so I'm, I'm staying a lot on this one because that's, that's the only way to get um, something up from zero to nothing. And it's important because I've had people in the space who wanted to step in and build something. And sometimes during COVID especially, it took two years to get the license and life has moved on. Life has moved on from what they wanted to do. And by the time the license came, they're like, you know what? I was going to live in Nigeria before I'm moving to Canada. Oh, my child now has. So things has moved. So imagine if I had to wait for that. That's what I'm saying. That that's one of the most crucial things. The second one is absolutely vendor relationships. So when we moved past that, we moved into a vendor relationship. What did we do? We used their API. So they already have a technology infrastructure. As much as we were building internally, it was important that we we go speed to market is important. So we use their APIs to power wallet creation, use your APIs for transfers, use your APIs for whatever services. And it's, again, it's a win-win. They charge us for it. We put a slight mark of the share of the market, the share of the pie at that time, typically sometimes stays with the bank. I mean, but I would also like to say it's quite important. I've learned that even in a partner relationship for, uh, for uh, I also did POS and um, POS uh, terminal, partnership but it's important one of the biggest lessons i learned is in partnerships there's a power dynamic you could flag me if my time is running out in partnerships there's a power dynamic and oftentimes the bank is as more power than the fintech at least at the early stage and so one of the things i learned was to make sure you test out you you have a pilot even if it's 30 days before you sign that contract now i'm talking to fintech excuse me banks because one of the things uh, when we uh, launched, uh, when we pivoted to agency banking in 2020, some March 2020, before COVID, just as COVID was hitting, was when we deployed the first 100 terminals into the market. And if I hadn't tested with 100 terminals, if I had signed the contract with whatever partner I was working with at that time, it would have been brutal. I wouldn't have been able to to get out of something that would have killed the company. So at the end of the day, also remember that the bank is solving for itself. You also have to solve for yourself. They have their stakeholders might not be the same as yours. And so it was important. So after we tested out it on the terminals and then I was able to quickly flag. I mean, I haven't done that before. So that learning process let me flag clauses in the contract that would not fly. And that saved, that literally saved the company. I think some of three other um, most important, I'll say uh, strategic investment. We haven't seen beyond place things like, we haven't seen bank fintech strategic investment. And I think it's important. Strategic investment because I mean, banks to remain appealing and competitive, they need to transfer, they need to move into an agile um, customer centric organizations. Like you see, even the telcos are trying to become a fintech at heart. And but becoming it is not just about branding, it's about the culture from the inside, it's about the people. And so sometimes that strategic investment is a pipeline to a bit of a, 
we need to see such mergers and acquisition within the space. It's a pipeline to actually hire some of those talents so that they can come to change things from within. And I think um, that's something we should be looking forward to in the space. And finally, I would say research and product to market collaboration. But oftentimes, one of the challenges there is um, there is always a conflicting goal what the fintech wants and what the bank wants at the end of these times they want the same thing they want the customer and so we less of that collaboration of uh, product to market and that becomes difficult i think finally is also within that product to market is um it, it fintech being able to leverage the fiscal infrastructure of a, of a, an existing bank but i think what's important is i'm just listing out this, this um in rounding up i'm just listing out this critical portions of where a fintech and a bank, from my experience, can move quickly to market and solve the challenges of bringing in or solving the challenge of the customer in a way that is symbiotic and make sure that fintech survives and also make sure that the bank remains competitive. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much, Tony. That was very insightful. Um, I thought that the first point about you know, the banks helping you know, fintech Navigate through um, regulatory waters was quite insightful, and also very sincere. You know, you pointing out the um, red flags or the parts or the clauses that didn't work for the fintech, right? Looking at it as both parties have different incentives in this is very useful, right? Thank you very much. Um, for we move on to our next speaker, which is Mr. Benga Ajayi. Just like to point, I like to add that we have a fourth speaker, Daniel Hauser, CEO of Web WebLogy. He's going to be joining um, virtually. Yeah, so he will speak after Mr. Benga Ajayi. So over to you. Hi, can everyone hear me? Oh, perfect. Uh, can we have the presentation? Uh, if you don't, can we have it? Okay. I'll have to be signaling to you, so like calling a taxi. Okay, so um, hi everyone. My name is Benga Jai. I work for uh, a venture capital firm called QED. It's very uncomfortable. Um, and I just take maybe sort of very quick, sort of one minute to talk about um, about QED, and then I can talk about some of the things we've seen globally with bank and fintech partnerships. Uh, we're one of sort of I think the maybe three global fintech investors. Actually, I think there are two. Uh, that invest everywhere in the world and do fintech, and we're one of those. Uh, we have, uh, as you can see on the screen, we've invested you know wide across. Uh, we have 25 unicorns out of 100 investments. So, you know, uh, you know, uh, fintech is all we do. Not a single one of his investment is not fintech. Uh, we've invested in all types of verticals, work with all types of banks. And what's interesting is QD was founded by somebody. Who used to who built a bank to compete with banks in the U.S. So we've been on both sides of the uh, of the equation. Um, I get asked this question a lot: What does QED mean? For the geeks in the room and those of us that uh, liked for the math of engineering, uh, it means uh, court error at uh, demonstration, which is you know if you're you know proving something out. Um, and the reason why I say this is that we take a very very focused uh unit economics approach to the companies that we work with and to how we look at products uh we're very very rigorous around you know can you make money per customer how long does it take and we just don't invest just you know just for the sake of like fintech um yeah as i said uh there's a couple of sort of you know uh, uh names i think we have maybe almost all the uh unicorns that we've invested in there um everything from sort of buy now pay later to to auto financing uh to actually banking as a service to crypto uh to pos terminals plays and um i think i think about 12 countries uh covered in there uh so we've been doing this since 2007 and and very happy to uh, discuss with any startups that are uh, in the room after so i think the first thing um that to know when we talk about fintechs and banking partnerships is that you know fintechs are no longer this is not i think five six years ago Everybody here was kind of wondering what are these things, what are these fintechs, who are these sort of people that don't comb their hair and wear face caps to the office, what is it that they're doing, and what do they know about financing? And we've now seen like you know they're here to stay. This is 
they're no longer just upstarts. If you think in terms of revenue, um, you know, or valuations of customers, um, you know, I, you know, the, the fintechs in Nigeria have achieved more than $100 million of revenue that did not exist five years ago. They were not there five years ago, right? Um, if you think in terms of valuations, there's at least three fintechs in Nigeria that have crossed the $500 million valuation mark, at least three. If I look at Africa, if I look at the countries where Quebec is present, that number is around nine that I have seen myself just in the last two months, right? Um, and if you look of customers, right, a lot of people will be like, but who's going to use this? You know, there's one fintech in Nigeria that has 6 million customers that did not exist. In fact, the person that founded did graduated seven years ago. And they have 6 million customers. There's another fintech that we're also talking to that has almost close to 200,000 businesses that they work with. But these are businesses that didn't exist again seven, six years ago. So all of these things are increasing. This is no longer just sort of like, as I said, just a couple of people trying to displace banks. I think they're here to stay. So why should banks care? Uh, I think I'll speak to the banks in the room and I'll speak to the fintechs. Uh, the first thing why banks should care is the unrivaled customer satisfaction that fintechs tend to give. Because these are digital natives focused very much on customer experience and technology, the customer satisfaction is actually much superior to what banks um, often provide. And if you're a banker in the room, that is something that you should be worried about. So I used to work for a company called TransferWise, which was a cross-border remittance service. Our NPS score was 91%. Um, Western Union that we're competing against, the NPS score was 21 um, so there's kind of no reason to talk about what people are going to use. Um, I don't have these numbers for Nigeria, but I think it'd be an interesting experience if we did the NPS calls for Nigerian banks and the NPS calls for uh, some of the fintechs. This is the first reason why banks should care. The customers do care, they love these products and they will start to move their minds. The second reason is fast growth. These companies grow really, really fast. As I've said, companies have achieved, you know, uh, uh, $100 million annualized revenue in less than five years. They move really, really, really fast. They don't do committees to make decisions. They just make it when they feel like it and things go very fast. And the last thing that I think that banks should be worried about is what I call the age of the super fintech, which is coming. What do I mean by the super fintech? A lot of fintechs, if you see, especially in Nigeria, started out with like a single product line. We're going to talk to this merchant. We're going to do this. Paga is going to come and talk uh, later. You can see like how many things that they, that they do now. You have the age of the super fintechs where fintechs start and as soon as they have a relationship with the customer, they start to upsell and start to provide other, other things. And we also feel that there's going to be consolidation in the sector. So if you think it's getting a bit annoying to compete with a small fintech, imagine when the super ones come, right? That's where banks should care. So why should fintechs care? Um, I think the first one you talked about, uh, Tommy talked about it. I think, you know, regulatory strength, not just in terms of the fact that the banks have the licenses um, or the banks, you know, sort of like, or, you know, speak to central bank and all of that, which is important. But banks tend to have something that fintechs don't have, which is regulatory muscle. Like, how do you deal with the regulator? What's important from a risk standpoint? A lot of, a lot of fintechs don't have that. A lot of startup guys don't have that. Frankly, they haven't been around long enough, right? So that's one reason why you should care to partner with banks. Um, the other reason why fintech should care to partner with banks is banks have a lot of unhappy customers. Um, the, uh, uh, the easiest, the, the best thing for a fintech is an unhappy customer. I'm sorry, Isaac. Uh, um, uh, you should care because there's lots of unhappy customers and that's a good way for you to go um, and help the bank, either help the bank with the unhappy customers or um, take them away. Um, and the third one is that banks have a lot of money. And now, when I talk about money, there is capital is a commodity now. There's every investor, everybody's investing in startups, not that kind of money. The one I call the profit type, like banks know how to run P&Ls. They've run these businesses, they have profits, they have this money, and they typically have to kind of either reinvest this money or pay it out in dividends. Um, what tends to happen is they mostly pay most of it out in dividends you should care about going to them and helping them with that profit and putting it to good use. So just very quickly, wanted to kind of talk about sort of like, so what do I mean like this? What's the landscape? The way we see it, uh, and we have a paper on this coming out with, uh, with BCG, I think, I think it came out yesterday or it will come out today, 
is there sort of three types of, and I've tried to kind of put this around all the companies um, in Nigeria and in Africa. Um, I've re replaced the slide. There's like three categories of fintechs. There's people that we call enablers. Those are the ones that help banks, right? So in some way, you know, you have an API that is plugged into a bank, allowing people to push and pull or whatnot. So those are like sort of like, you know, helping banks. Um, then there's what we call the agency competitors. Those are the people that do what the banks could do, but are not doing or are not doing well, right? And then you've obviously got the direct competitors. Now, these are all companies that I've spent some time talking to in the last few months. Um, you know, you can chop and change and, and switch them around. Um, and, and so these are like the categories of sort of fintechs. And I think there's sort of different strategy for some of them. The enablers, banks are already kind of working with. The agile set competitors, I think there's lots of value there for banks to like go in there, make sure they don't become direct competitors or at least partner with them so that when they become direct competitors, you're already kind of embedded in the offering, right? So I'm not sure it's a match made in heaven, but I think we can make the match here on hers uh, uh, with bank and fintech partnerships. Um, I think there's, you know, there's a bunch of things. Um, Tom talked about some of them. Like there's, there's stuff like licensing, payment processing, the regulatory thing that I think is important where, um, where bank and fintech could partner. There's also product depth and product breadth. What do I mean? So, you know, a lot of fintechs start by doing solving like, sort of a very hard problem, but not fully solving it because they don't have all of the capacity. Um, working with banks can allow you to actually go much deeper um, and vice versa, allow banks to actually reach like a new sort of, uh, a new set of customers, right? Um, and then the other thing is sort of product expansion. As we said, lots of fintechs are starting to think of doing things that banks have been doing. For example, giving out loans, right? That's something that everybody wants to do but the people that know how to do it are actually the bankers in the room. And so why not partner with them to kind of understand how to do that much better, focus on the customer. And then the last thing, we haven't seen this happen uh, very much. We haven't seen that happen at all in Nigeria. I think Tommy talked about it is, is acquisition. Um, if I was a banker today in Nigeria, um, or if I was a top banker today in Nigeria, I'd be thinking very seriously about how to do acquires or even acquisitions to bolster my product, uh, my product trends. Some of those innovation would obviously come from outside. So, um, I think I'm over my time, just uh, to give sort of quick summary. I think fintechs are growing faster. Um, um, they're growing much faster. They're much easier to launch, much easier to build. Uh, banks are playing a, playing a catch-up game. And so I think there's, there's lots of opportunities for synergy here. Um, digitization is actually just increasing. It's much easier to build a fintech now than it was five years ago. So let that sink in just how many more they're going to come. Um, you know, fintech and banking, I think, combine the best of both worlds, which is both the old world and the new world. But uh, uh, for the Jay-Z fans in the room, you know that the best of both worlds album didn't quite come out uh, as well. So a note of caution there as well. It takes two to tango, you know, the banks and you need the fintechs. Uh, but I think this type of partnerships could really, really um, turbocharge and actually be much better for the customer. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Binga. That was very insightful. I thought that was useful that you highlighted the different, you know, strengths that both parties have. Yeah, fintechs are able to move fast, you know, look into serving, like you said, unhappy customers of banks. You know, however, one thing that we've noticed is, you know, just one regulation can actually just shut down what you're doing if you're not compliant in Nigeria. So it's also important that banks have that going for them. So thank you very much for that. Very insightful. Um, up next, I'd like to have Daniel Hausa come up. Let me know if it's Daniel. Yes, he's here. Hello. Yeah. You can, can go you ahead. Okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm Daniel Awasa. I'm the co-founder of uh, Weblogy. Uh, we are a pioneer in like the digital media and fintech space. Uh, we started our company about uh, 25 years ago, uh, making the bet that the internet will change the world. And uh, we're still uh, working to provide digital services, creating content, providing a digital e-commerce platform, wallet, and co-creating with banks. Uh, the internet has a huge impact and has changed our world 
However, sadly, in the financial world, uh, the change is still very little uh, in terms of the way we transact, the way we save, the way we borrow, the way we invest, the way we manage our money. Uh, unfortunately, still less than 1% of the loans are made online. So there is still like a huge opportunity. And uh, we are proud that we have invested in FinTech. Uh, we have uh, developed a super app uh, that we co-create with EcoBank, UBA, NCA Bank, and Visa uh, to provide uh, and to help banks make smarter decisions, increase efficiency, serve the customer on the digital channel, and open opportunities. Um, however, the, the challenge that, that we see in that space is the culture is very different. I mean, uh, you're in Nigeria and uh, we are in Ivory Coast. Uh, the rules are not the same. The, the bank leaders are not the same. The vision are not the same. The culture are not the same. The priority are not the same. Um, we're coming from a different breed of company and the bank are looking at risk. And so we're looking at first providing an opportunity by solving a problem for the banks. And the biggest challenge that we see is how can we reduce the amount of risk that the bank are taking by uh, engaging in a relationship with the customer? Uh, how can we deliver services faster how can we care more about the customer? We try to focus on what actually does not change. And we believe that whatever service you would want to provide, the customer service needs to be good. And this is the only way that the service will survive. The other challenges that we see is um, challenges in, in governance. As uh, you grow a fintech company, how the fintech company is managed is really critical. At the beginning, it's a small team of people taking decisions. We are very agile, but we have seen often that uh, there is issue in governance that can affect the business model of those fintechs. And the, the governance also help uh, take in account the, the risk management, which helps you build a more sustainable business. And uh, we try to partner with company that can help us reduce the risk. Uh, how can we analyze, how can we share the risk with other players? And uh, so that, you know, we built a more sustainable business model. Um, well, we believe there is a lot of opportunity. We are in the land where a lot still needs to be done. And uh, we are in Francophone Africa and we've been focusing in Francophone Africa because we understand the continent is big, but to be able to tackle all those opportunities, we cannot create alone, we have to co-create. So we try to reach out to other partners, other banks that wants to come to Francophone Africa and try to co-create and improve the customer experience. Thank you. That, you know, you might not be able to put in place, right? I know, um, interestingly, it's a joke people make about how um, Facebook now meta used to be, the motor used to be move fast and break things. And after they had to change it to move fast and build like stable infrastructure, right? So 
Yeah, so um, there's only so much you can do moving fast. Yeah, so um, thank you very much, Daniel. Now we're going to have Isaac Kamuta speak to us and Manka in the room. Over to you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I hope you, you can hear me. If I, let me start first by you know thanking you all of you for uh, for coming for this uh, breakfast uh, series. I uh, know I'm completely outnumbered uh, here by the fintechs. So maybe next time uh, we're going to have to add, so increase the number of, of bankers uh, in the panel. Uh, and you can even see where they put me in the corner completely, uh, in, in the corner. I don't know that I stand a chance. Um, but, you know, this will, um, and again, thank you, Bolaji, our MD, for also being here with us uh, this morning and the, those that are connecting online. Um, when I think about collaboration and, uh, and, and partnerships, I think, and I'll sort of look at it from a, a banker's point of view. Um, and, and before I move into that, um, you know, it's not that banks haven't been innovative. Um, and I, again, I don't sound defensive here, um, but banks have been quite innovative in the past. If you look at the journey the, in, in 1950s, uh, banks came together and they were able to launch um, you know, the first credit card. Uh, and I think Visa and MasterCard have taken it on to, you know, to another level. That was quite revolutionary uh, that somebody can be moving with this money in the pocket. That was unheard of. Um, you'll also remember around 1982, uh, you know, banks also stepped forward. And I think that's when the first uh, online banking transactions were done from, you know, from home. Most of you remember Chemical Bank, you remember Citibank, you remember Bank of America, Bank Hanover. These are all the first banks that did the first, first, you know, home-based banking, where you could actually transact uh, from your home and not have to go to the bank. Uh, and that was in the 80s, in early 80s. That was also, I think, quite innovative in its nature, and I, I would say revolutionary at that point in time. And then in the late, um, and, and I would say late, early 90s, internet banking also came in. And you know, banks were the first to take advantage of the internet and really make banking accessible. So if you look back, uh, banks have always been quite, um, you know, quite, quite innovative uh, and leveraging technology to be able to, uh, you know, to advance the course of, of banking and serve, and serve customers. But when I look at it from a, a partnership collaboration point of view, and I, and, and I think also want to thank my fellow panelists, I think it is it's critical, um, you know, as a, as a fintech, when you're raising up a business, at the end of the day, you want to scale. You want to scale. There's no point of having a, a business and then you only have got, you know, 100,000 customers. The reason why Africa is considered a very attractive market is, you know, of, you know the, over a billion plus people that are in the African continent. And of course, 200 of, and over 200 million are in this country where we are speaking from uh, you know, this morning. And that's why you can have a FinTech having 6 million you know, customers in, in, in Nigeria. And that also informs why as EcoBank, um, you know, we've decided to you know, anchor our payments business out of Nigeria as we seek to um, you know, scale it across most of, most of Af Africa. So scale is, is, is very important. And you have to have that in the back of your mind. When you get started, you want to acquire customers very quickly, but you also want to make sure that you, you take scale. So when you're looking at then, how do you develop partnerships? You must have that end state um, you know, in mind. And, and I think as EcoBank, um, you know, and I, again, a lot of thanks to our pioneers that you know, started up this, you know, this, this, this company, which now operates in 33 countries. And, you know, the idea that you could have one banking group that operates in 33 countries in the African continent, uh, and of course we have now an international branch in Paris, removes the border and actually makes Africa available. It makes that whole a billion people actually available to anybody that wants to, you know, to launch a business. And, and I think that is something that we are very, very proud of. So when you're looking at, you know, who do you partner with? I think you need to look at how do you ensure that as your business grows, you've got scale. Um, and, and it's not just presence in the African continent that's important. It is interconnected presence. Um, you know, for example, and I think, again, back to our founding fathers of this bank, you know, EcoBank operates as one bank. 
And that means we've got one technology, um, you know, it's one technology, one look and feel, everything is one from the center. And what that means is if I connect you in Nigeria, uh, where you as a you know, FinTech, you may be starting here in Nigeria, but tomorrow when you want to go to Ghana or you want to go to Kenya or you want to go to Tanzania or you want to go to Zimbabwe, you don't need to do any other integration. I'm just be enabling your countries as you grow. And, and I think that is the important, um, you know, conversation. And part of the reason why we're having this FinTech breakfast series, uh, you know, with, with technology companies and FinTech is just to make sure that that is available. It is possible today. Others are taking advantage of it. And I think when you choose uh, partners, you have to have that, uh, that, that in your mind because you need to make sure that you can scale quickly. And if, if you're going to have to do uh, an integration in every country that you move into, uh, then you go to reduce your speed, um, you, you struggle with your go to market and you know that that can be a challenge and I think so choosing a partner that is as good scale across the African continent, I think is, um, is absolutely important and I think and critical. The second thing is, uh, and I think my fellow panelists have talked about it as well is, is regulation, you know regulation. Um, part of the reason why fintechs have been able to move very fast is they are not as heavily regulated. As, as, the, as the banks. Part of the reason why we are slow is because we are under huge scrutiny. We have a lot of uh, you know, resources that we have allocated to ensuring that we comply. And this is not a Nigeria uh, phenomenon. It is not just uh, an African phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon. All banks globally are heavily regulated. In fact, I was looking at the latest statistics. Uh, you, know, um, you know, globally banks are spending around $70 billion on just you know, regulation. I think one of the banks globally has got 30,000 compliance officers, 30,000 you know, compliance officers. You know, it just shows you that, you know, when you talk about, if you are talking about a million, you know, 30,000 compliance officers. And Nigeria um, is, no, is no exception, it's the same, same scale. And, and the reason why we, we have all those compliance officers and all those people is to ensure that everything that we do then operates within the, within the law. And so by partnering with choosing your partners well and work with banks, the banks ensure that you remain safe, you do things within the law, and that ensures then you can also be able to scale very, very fast. So the partnership, I think, with banks and leveraging the investment they have already made on compliance officers and technology and all those things, I think is critical, um, you know, for the fintechs that are here. And so um, maybe I thought I should just mention that and because I know we will have Q&A, we'll have opportunity to speak more. Uh, but those are the two things that I really like to just pack there as we continue in this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isaac. I mean, the way he said 30,000 compliance officers. 30,000. I mean, he really, and I thought about it. That's a lot, actually. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, but just, that's the price, you know, to pay. And, you know, and that point he made, I thought was very insightful, was actually talking about how the whole purpose of starting, you know, a company, startup, you want to have scale. And there's arguably no one that I don't see online someone complaining about getting to another African country and not being able to make payment or do something right so it's kind of important to for bank so for startups to actually think of partnering with companies or bigger banks that have this skill so that they are not having to do one by one integration so thank you very much very insightful thank you everyone for listening um, this brings us to the end of the first half which is just hearing from the different speakers I'm sure a lot of questions have come in via Slido. If you haven't shared, you can still share your questions. I will be going on a short, a brief five minutes break, and then we'll now ask the questions. Um, oh, okay, I can just go ahead. All right. Okay, so now the questions. Uh, we're gonna start questions. Just waiting for the questions to display. Else, I'll, I'll just, okay. Depending when the questions come in, I'm just going to ask questions that have been sent ahead of time. So the first question will go to Tommy. Um, so this is, oh, as an early stage fintech, how do you know when it's the right time to partner with a bank, especially for first time founders? Starting from the beginning. Um, it's like we said, it's almost like your baby and you need guardians. And at the end of the day, for every, as long as you're a fintech, you need regulation. 
as long as you're fintech, you need infrastructure, you need switches, you need a wallet system. So the first thing is to start finding a partner who might be, who is warm. It's, I'm using a uh, who is open. Uh, uh, there's a bank, there's a regional bank in Nigeria that I think that's how they scaled just being open to fintechs. And I think it was, a, it was a mindset they had that other banks didn't have at the time. And they just became almost like a, like a partner to all of the fintechs. They open your account, they understand. So they don't make you feel like we are, we are against each other. They feel like, oh, we are in this together. We are going, we have the same goal. We are here for you. And they scaled just being able to do that. Now they are going straight into the market themselves and all of that, but their sustenance came from there. So the first thing is to just look at the bank who has strength in whatever you're looking for. Is he, uh, is he, infra is he technology infrastructure? Look for the bank who has that. Is it uh, like, uh, like he said, is it around you want to scale quickly across markets? Look for the bank who has that. Is it regulatory strength? Look for the bank who has that. Is it that they are able to give you some form of credit because some banks do not, no matter how much business they want, they say they can do loans better. I, I don't know. But the thing is, is it that they are more open to giving you the credit line you need to, to, to run the business? Just to seek that out immediately and hit them and get the warm introduction and get things going. That's it. Right. Thank you very much. I think that's something different. Like five years ago, I probably wouldn't have I don't think this was like a popular narrative, just like, oh, we're going to start and then we're going to go up against the banks and we're going to take over, right? Well, now it's, it's different and it's, you know, it's meaningful. It's reality, actually. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, next, Benga, uh, this question is for you. Uh, so when you, uh, the question is, you know, what role does partnership with banks play when you're considering like valuing or investing in fintechs, right? Because I've spoke to an investor and it's like, oh, it's important that the companies or the founders have some form of relationship with banks or they know some, or they have like, basically what role does that play when you're looking at investing? Well, it depends on, it depends on the type of company. Um, can, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Well, it depends on the kind of company. I mean, in some cases, some uh fintechs are trying to disrupt banks right just like trying to do something and so you're looking for a relationship like they understand the bank uh, in that sense in some cases you need some sort of regulatory sort of uh, muscle or approval uh, and in some of the cases like Tommy was saying you do need to have sort of maybe infrastructure or sponsoring you know for your being sponsorship for all those things so it really depends I don't think it's a one size fits all it depends on the vertical within which the uh, within which the fintech is playing, the truth of the matter is that banks give you speed to speed to market. So by having some sort of banking partner, you're potentially able to kind of you know get very quickly and launch. But it's very very dependent. Some products are very heavily sort of regulatory dependent, and so you need banking partners. Um, some product kind of you know maybe not necessarily so much, right? So you know for example, as I said, you know I. I worked at a company that, you know, almost got to two, three hundred million dollars of revenue, um, not by having a direct relationship with a bank. Like they became a unicorn before they had a banking relationship officer. They had bank accounts, um, that you, but you couldn't stop them. So in that case, it wasn't a, it wasn't necessary. So you need to think about what part of the uh, what part of the uh, technology stack and the go-to-market stack that you're in, um, and that would like like, like wait it. Okay, thank you very much. That's useful. So it's a bit nuanced, yep. right? So it's not just oh, go and get a banking partner, you know, so that you. But then, of course, depending on the line of business you're doing, it makes sense to do that. So to um Isaac, uh, I think this question is, you know, very obvious for Echo Bank to even host this. It means you're looking into fintechs. But the question is, or they are paying more attention to that sector. What do banks look out for in fintechs that they are potentially trying to partner with? Yeah, th thanks again um, for, the, for that question. So first of all, um, as a bank, um, we, we're committed to ensuring that anybody out there that has a dream of building something in this continent succeeds. Um, and, and because that's why EcoBank was, was started. It, it, was, uh, you know, it was started to help Africans uh, or deliver first class banking services to Africans in the continent. So we, we have a mission of 
ensuring that any African here or anyone that has a dream, uh, you know, can get that dream fulfilled. Um, so that's as a starting as a, as a starting point. We want everybody to succeed. We want more and more unicorns to come out of you know to come out of Africa. They generate employment. They you know they make banking accessible to everybody. Nobody is going to solve that problem for us if we don't solve it here ourselves in Africa. Because people in the West they don't understand, they don't understand the challenges that we are going through here. So any fintech that is out there try to solve a problem. Um, because at the end of the day, it comes down to that, whether you, all the big, you know, fintechs that are here, they're all addressing a specific problem uh, in the African continent. So anybody out there that's trying to solve a problem that needs, um, you know, financial service or needs a bank, as Echo Bank, we are available, we are open, we would like to support. So that's just on the, on the, on the outset. Now, having said that, when we're sitting down and, and we're looking at how do we support, how do we enable, how do we help the, you know, the fintech scale? Of course, the first thing that we tend to look at is what problem are you solving? You know, you know because it's, 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 it's one thing to just have a, a solution, one thing to really be able to say, I'm solving this particular problem. And I think the, the years we've got and the experience that we have in the industry, um, you know, working with different sectors gives us uh, enough information you know, to be able to provide advisory services to some of those um, fintechs at that early stage. So we can be able to validate some of your ideas that you have. Um, you know, the advantage we have as a bank is that we, we see everything. You know, we work with the big guys, we work with the small guys, the small medium enterprises, we look, work with individuals, we are in all sectors, from agriculture to transport to manufacturing. And so when we sit down in a room, you know, with you, and again, the focus that we have on fintechs, uh, you know, has enabled us to create a department here within the bank where we can be able to sit down with you. So we can be able to provide advice we can be able to say, okay, what problem are you trying to solve? And we can be able to provide insights. As we provide those insights, we are doing it from a, from a banking mindset. And we're also not doing it from a Nigeria point of view. As I've said, we operate in 33 countries. We've got people on the ground. We open our branches in 33 countries in Africa, from you know, Senegal in the West to Zimbabwe in the South, to Sao Tome and Principe. Uh, to Gabon, to East Africa, we, there's no economy in the continent. I think um, you know where we are not um, that significant that we are not we are not there. So when we sit down with you, we are able to listen to the problem that you are trying to solve, maybe in this particular country, but also bring in the African perspective, the local knowledge that exists beyond the you know the country of uh, of, of, of of origin. So that's also something else that we, that we tend to look. And then of course, thirdly, governance is important. And, and a lot of fintechs, you know, struggle in later stages because they overlooked, you know, governance, they overlooked, um, you know, controls, they overlooked, um, you know, regulation. And I always call that as, is like a weapon of mass destruction. It's like in there, just waiting to explode at some point in time. And I think when we sit down with fintechs and we are talking to them and we are, uh, you know, analyzing, these are some of the small, small things that our bankers, um, you know, you know, will we'll point out and say, you know, think about that. Um, maybe add an advisory board, maybe add a few people, you know, in to enable you to have a well thought out, um, you know, business case. So that at least the problem is there. You also to look at, you know, is how big is the problem so that you're not just solving a problem in one place and therefore later on you come to struggle with scale. So those are some of the things that we, you know, we, we tend to look at when we work with, you know, with fintechs. But as I've said, we want to make sure that every African out there that goes an idea is given a chance. And that's, I think that's why our bankers, I think Corede, you know, is here. We've got um, our executive director here as, as, as well, Kola. That, that's what we do. We want to make sure that everybody gets a chance. And I think that's, that's what EcoBank is here for. Oh, thank you very much. That's a very warm answer. This is like, everybody, you're invited, just come, <laughs> right? And yeah, and you know, you've backed it up. Yeah, you can put your hands together. And you've backed it up by you know talking about the reach and the experience of the bank. And I, I know that there is this is not actually a big question, but it's just someone asking. I guess it's just as simple as people stepping into a branch and asking, because when you're approaching a very big organization, it's sort of you're like, who do we talk to? Right? Do we go? the top or do we you know start from the bottom and then he doesn't get there right yes yeah, so 
Um, that's just a follow up, right? Just for people that are listening to want to know because EcoBank is very big. So you're kind of like, who do we reach out to? Or well, how does it work? Yeah, so thanks again. That, that's a very, very, very good question. So again, because of the focus that we have on, on the FinTech as an industry, we've created a department within the payments business that deals absolutely with fintech. So if you walk into the counter here in, in, in EcoBank within the payments business, there's a team that's dedicated to um, dealing with fintechs. Um, you know, we we'll have actually we have a deck that we share with you um, in as we as we as we go along. Bio uh, Kejawa, who is actually in the audience there, is the head of fintechs and partnerships. Um, and we have we have an, uh, we have 33 other bios in our 33 countries so when you go to um, zimbabwe or you go to uganda or you go to kenya you find the equivalent of bio in that in that market and and i think that is the focus that we want to we want to give in order to struggle or to talk to and we've got a department um you know within the payments business that looks after fintechs and then once we listen to you and we've got a new idea and we have figured out what exactly you want to do we are then able to bring in the bankers in our corporate bank if you require services you know within colors team if you are within the commercial banking um, the banking space we have a team that deals with that as well we're able to bring in other people into the conversation but at least the entry point is you know, for nigeria is bio and we've got a couple of other in every country we have payments and cash management heads in each in all our three countries uh, who will be your point of call to have that conversation and then we we'll bring in other bankers as and uh, when, when required Thank you very much. So you've heard that. Yeah, so it's, it's very straightforward. And, you know, you can always give feedback if, you know, um, you're know, still not getting feedback, but it's very straightforward and the response has been very warm. I'm going to send to Isaac. Okay, awesome. That's a good Thank start. <laughs> yeah, so to, Bing, to Binga, uh, I'd just like to ask if, so what's key, I'm sure you've seen a couple of bank fintech partnerships. What um, key elements have you seen that made them successful? Just give some examples also. Yeah, so I think there's maybe sort of like three things that we've seen, and I can give a couple of examples globally. I think the first one is that this has to be sponsored right from the top. Um, it's got to be some C-suite sponsorship. If it's regulated from the banking side, it's just somebody doing this so that the bank can say they're doing it, it usually won't succeed because this usually involves a change in the way that the bank is doing stuff and involves taking on some risk. So the first thing is like it requires this sponsorship in some of the successes that we've had, um, you know, we've absolutely had to have conversations with someone in the C-suite uh, for things to happen. Uh, the second one is around culture and capabilities. Um, I think EcoBank is already kind of on the journey there, but like a lot of banks have a very, very different culture into sort of speed to market, how you kind of innovate, how you launch, how you can like, you know, you know, fintechs can, somebody can have like an inspiration in traffic on Monday if it's a product on Friday, right? With marketing, like that's how quick and banks can go that quick. You need to kind of think through, you know, what would the regulators say all of this? So there's all sort of like culture and capabilities that I think is sort of the third, um, the second thing that I think it's important that, that makes the partnership succeed. Um, and I think the third thing is also just then kind of like, identifying like areas of like, at the end of the day, you're probably competing, right? You're kind of competing, but your part, your partner is competing. So you need to identify sort of areas of sort of net gain and you kind of have that established um, directly with the bank and, and with the FinTech. So a couple of examples, um, it's a company called Wild, Wildfire um, in the US that essentially kind of, they do rewards, savings and all of these things for customers. And then banks literally actually like offer those, um, those products to their customers. Right. Um, there's a company called Treasury Prime, uh, which we actually invested in, which doing sort of banking as a service, helping other fintechs, but plug directly into the banks, something similar to what Isaac was saying. But actually, they have the relationship with the banks and then other fintechs can plug into them. Um, and then a lot of fintechs have access to the banks and payments networks um, and they're growing. Right. So there's a couple of different types of types of examples. Another one maybe uh, um, is one called Wise for Banks. So, so Transfer Wise, for example, do money movement transfer. Um, unlike, you know, Echo Bank is probably ahead, but lots of banks have many branches in many countries that operate on different rails and different infrastructure. They help them to bring that together, for example. So there's lots of examples where you've had fintechs come from the outside and actually enable banks or partner with banks able to serve their customers. But I think those three things are the most important things. C-suite um, sponsorship, 
you really need to think about your culture and capability and then identifying areas of sort of like you know overlap and 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 drawbacks regulation etc thank you very much it's very insightful Tommy. I just wanted to point out, and I think it's going to add to what uh, Daniel said. Uh, I wanted to point out that one of the biggest blockers to partnership is the zero sum game mentality. And it's critical to know that First Bank existed. What was the population of Nigeria at the time they started up to, even up to the 1960s, where it was with just about 50 million? Zeni Bank, GTB came on and still thrived without killing. First banks and all of the other banks. The important thing also to note is that what what we've historically seen kill banks more is not is less is not about the fact that it's customer it's more corporate governance is more is more I mean fraud and all of those things. And so when we are building fintech, it's almost like and the partnership has to be thought around in expansion of this pie. There's a lot more people that can still thrive. The banks can thrive, and there are new banks which are the fintechs can also thrive. Now, what would separate the boys from the men would always be around the corporate governance, would always be about the regulatory relationship, would always be about how the banks also can now start moving fast and being customer centric, just the same way the fintechs are. And I think it's very critical, even as Nigeria, because we tend to see things from a, your gain is our loss, uh, his loss is your gain, but we are at, more people need banking services than what the banks were serving 10 years ago. So naturally, more banks have to come out to fit into that without having to, if as long as the old banks are doing what needs to be done, moving fast and being customer centric, they don't particularly, it will be an exchange of, I will take more from you, I will bring more in, you take more from me, and the market can thrive. So I think if we think from that perspective, it's important to know that we can just grow the market beyond. It's a small pie. Thank yeah, you. thank you very much. That's very, you know, very insightful. Thank you very much. Um, you know, while she was talking, I got reminded of a, it's a popular slang, Wagmi, which is we're all going to make it, right? <laughs> so if you, I mean, so that's basically what she said, we're all going to make it. And that's a very useful mindset. So we've come to the end of this session now. Thank you to all our speakers, uh, both here and online. Thank you very much. So now we're just going to be, the next session is going to be on Pan-African expansion opportunities, which will begin shortly. So thank you very much. Bye for now. Thank you. So we're going to go on a five minute break. Please um, feel free to go have breakfast, to mingle, talk to people, and then we're going to be back to speak with Tayo of VOC of Tiger Group. Thank you so much. minutes and then we're back five minutes and then we're back
Oke. Hello everyone, please, please let's come to our seats with our food, our cups of coffee and water and everything. We're going to get started shortly. Please, let's move to our seats, please. We're going to get started shortly. On that side. Okay. Okay, so where should I say here, right? Okay. Let's settle down. Let's settle down. everyone let's settle down you can take your food to your seats thank you everyone thank you we're going to get started in two minutes come to your seats. Thank you. Thank you so much. In our next session, we're going to be speaking to Mr. Taya Oviosu of Paga Group. Paga just turned 13 years old this year, I believe last month. 
They've achieved a lot of significant milestones. So I'm really looking forward to speaking with Taya. Let's settle down and we're going to start shortly. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So in this session, which I will also be moderating, we're going to be speaking about Pan-African expansion, some of the challenges and opportunities that exist. I really love conversations about expansion. Um, sometimes when you speak to fintech founders, they always say that Nigeria is a great test market. If your product or your suite of products is able to survive, thrive, and succeed in this market, then perhaps you have enough leverage to expand into another African market. Um, so, but the thing about expansion is that it's not an easy game at all. Different regions have different regulatory principles. They have different governmental policies. And as a founder, it is important that you understand, first of all, the challenges and then the opportunities that exist. Fintech startups, like many other businesses, desire to grow, not just within their initial base, but also into other regions as well. Partnerships are usually and sometimes even a recommended route for fintech for fintech startups however these partnerships must be carefully embarked upon how can fintechs leverage bank partnerships to expand across the continent how can they maximize the opportunities that such collaborations typically present while trying to navigate roadblocks as well and what types of challenges may stand in their way in our next session, I'll be discussing this with Tayo Viosu, founder and CEO of Paga Group in this very brief fireside chat. Paga is a mobile payment company focused on digitizing cash and delivering financial access in emerging markets. Paga is the leading mobile money service in Nigeria, its first market. Prior to Paga, Tayo was vice president at Travant Capital Partners, a private equity fund in West Africa. Prior to joining Travant, Tayo was a manager corporate development at Cisco Systems in San Jose, California. Tayo's work at Paga has been recognized globally. In 2014, CMBC selected Tayo as the Entrepreneur of the Year, West Africa. And in 2015, the Africa Leadership Network selected Paga as the Outstanding Growing Company of the Year in Africa. Tayo is also an Endeavor Entrepreneur and a member of the Young President's Organization. He has a passion to help entrepreneurs bring ideas to life and build scalable businesses. He is an active angel investor and co-founder of Kairos Angels, an angel investment club. So welcome, Tayo. Please join me. <laughs> Thank you. Can we hear? I think there's a, there might Important. be. I thought I, oh, there we go. All right, there we cool. go, there we All go. Right. So we're gonna have a 30 minute conversation with Tayo and then we're going to go into a 20 minute Q&A session. So remember to send your questions in through Slido and we'll get them answered within the time that we have. Um, so Tayo, let's get, let's jump right into it. Sure, okay, so Nigeria is a vast and underserved market. Mm -hmm. Why expand into other African countries? Is it due to investor pressure to diversify, which makes sense? Um, or is it a desire to grow your revenues or other factors that drive fintech firms yeah. to grow operations outside their country of founding? Yeah. So first of all, thank you very much uh, for having me here. Um, Mr. Bojalawa, thank you so much. Really good to see you again. Isaac and team really appreciate that you're doing this um, for the ecosystem. Um, I think it's really important. Um, and good to see everyone, everyone here. So again, I'm Matayo Viosu, founder and CEO of Paga. Um, just a little bit about what we do, first of all, just to sort of set, set that. Um, essentially, what we're focused on is how do we solve the use of cash and access to finance? Uh, make it simple for consumers, as well as small, medium businesses to pay and get paid and access financial services. And so we do that both directly through a couple of brands, but we also do it indirectly through our platform as a service. Um, and so on the direct side is the Paga brand for consumers, the Doroki brand for our small, medium businesses, um, which is like our version of Square, 
in, the, in a square terminal in a, in, a, in a store. And then we opened up all our infrastructure that we have built here in Nigeria to the ecosystem. So I'm really excited about what EcoBank is doing because it's essentially the same kind of thing, right? It's like you have built all of this infrastructure, all of these rails, let other people leverage it and, and let the ecosystem um, spur from that. Um, so for us as a business, when, you know, the, the coming to your question, our vision is that we want to make it simple for a billion people to access and use money. So out of principle, that already means going outside of Nigeria. Um, and, you know, and so we actually have gone through a journey of trying to figure out where do we go? Why should we go? Right. We even asked that question. The question you asked, like, why should we go? Nigeria is a big enough market. Why, why do we have this bigger ambition? Um, and, and the first thing that for us is that if you're in a big enough market where the macro conditions are awesome, you may not need to leave. Paytm has not left India, right? Paytm is doing very well. We, we went to India to look at Paytm, right? They're doing very well. Um, and they've not let, left India because the macros of India actually support it. Um, and I think the macros of Nigeria support building a big business here. But it also points to the fact that you want to, both for investors and shareholders and for the team who are pouring their life into it, also de-risk some of the macro elements of, of Nigeria. Um, and, and, so, and I think this is true of most African countries. So I think for any company in almost any country across the continent, you have to think about potentially leaving your country, right? I mean, you can see a lot of South African companies that don't leave South Africa, right? There's a very different conversation. That said, I think you have to think very carefully about not spreading yourself too thin. Um, and in fact, we've gone through a journey where we decided, first of all, that we're going to go, we've, we've been in Ethiopia from an operational perspective for a while. We have a team of about 50 people in Ethiopia. We've been doing business there for eight years, longer than eight years now. Um, and so Ethiopia is one that is very dear to us um, personally. And we're like, look, we want to do something here at some point. But then we also thought about why limit ourselves to Africa? Maybe we should go beyond Africa. So we actually went and I traveled around the world to different places to look at the markets, decided to go to a Latin American country, to Mexico. And we, during the pandemic, we decided to pull back from that. But that experience was very interesting for us because we learned quite a lot about what it takes to go launch in a new market. Um, and we created a playbook actually um, of like the things that you need to look for. And that's what we're now executing as we now are focusing across Africa in building out. So I think you have to be careful not to spread yourself too thin. Um, you don't, it's not by force to leave a country. I think you also have to make sure that um, you don't lose sight of your, your main market, especially if your first country is your biggest market. You don't want to lose sight of that. And then the fourth thing you, you find is all the countries are different. They have different nuances. And so you have to also be very careful about being sensitive to that. Um, I love the comment you made about setting up a playbook, right? Mm. Because it helps bring direction. Um, yeah. Beyond addressing a consumer market in another African country, there's also setting up your actual business, whether a physical Correct. location or not, yeah. and then hiring, right? Yeah. What are some of the challenges you've experienced um, with growing Paga yeah. um, out of the country um, in these other markets, specifically with putting together a team, yeah. you know, um, especially when you don't have deep insights into that market and how they work. How have you been yeah. able to overcome some of those challenges? So there are two things in what you said. One is the team side, but then the other is actually the, re the country's regulations about a legal entity, right, in the first place. And every country is very different on this, right? So right now, as I speak, we have legal entities in Nigeria, in, in Ethiopia, in the US, in the UK, in Mexico. A Mexico legal entity, every month we have to file, file taxes. Like there's a certain report that you have to file every month. It's not a quarterly annual thing. You miss it, you're in trouble, right? So you have, you have, you have a team just doing that, you know? Um, Ethiopia, the tax process, very different, right? I mean, and when they come to do their audit, it's an audit, like, you know, and it's really intense. So um, you... You have to understand, these are the things I'm learning after, oh yeah, let's go. <laughs> and then you now realize the cost of setting up legal entities. So right now, as we're thinking about Africa, we're like, okay, one of the questions in that playbook is, do we need a legal entity, local? Because I want to avoid it as much as I can, right? Um, not because, I don't want to avoid taxes, happy to pay taxes, but it's just the need of setting up that local entity, 
putting people in it and all that kind of stuff. Do we need that? Or in a global world, hiring your team doesn't have to be in a local legal entity, um, but you have to pay your taxes. So I think that's fair. So I think in terms of team, it's about thinking what talent do you need locally? And are you going to centralize certain functions or are you going to put certain things in the countries? And I think that's where the local nuances really start to play in. Um, and I think it's important then to think about, and also the relationships and engaging the partners, right? Because as much as we are, we are in the Zoom world, there's still something about seeing the person you're talking, you're, you're doing business with and really like building trust um, with them locally. Uh, so I think paying attention to that is important. My general you know, advice to people is don't look to scale into other countries too fast, right? Um, take time, be measured about it. Um, it's flashy to say, oh, we're in 25 countries, but you're really not, you know, like, um, so I think, I think just being careful not to spread yourself thin there is really important. So where fintech firms are concerned, right, um, they obviously start early stage mm -hmm. and some of them start off by bootstrapping before they raise mm -hmm. pre-seed, seed, series mm -hmm. A. Um, in your own opinion, when do you think is the best time to begin to consider? Is it while in that early stage where you're seeing some success or do you want to wait until you've received external capital that will allow you kind of leap into other markets? Yeah. I think it depends on your business. Every fintech is different. It depends on really what you're what you're addressing and how big your addressable market is in the current in the current market, and whether the opportunity you're addressing is one that is not a first to market game, right? Um, look, I think um, I have. I mean, I have companies I'm advising now who are in the seed phase and they've already gone to another country, and I look at it and I'm like, okay, it's going to be a distraction. Well, part of it is what they're addressing. If they just focused on Nigeria, they'll probably be dead soon, right? It's not big enough for what they're trying to address. And, it, and it's actually more established in another country where they can get it going. So I sort of get that logic, even though they're originally from Nigeria. Um, but, but I wouldn't advise it for, for most people. I would say get to series A-ish, right? Series B-ish before you think about really, and, and when I we use those terms, I really mean more in the scale of what you're executing. You have already figured out product market fit. You've already built a brand. You've built understanding of your business, right? Um, you know, like if I look at my experience at Paga, I didn't write a business case on Paga until our series A. And I'm like, the best advice, I tell you the best advice I got at the beginning was don't write the business plan was just do what it takes to, to the next step. Do, what's the next thing? Do it, do it. And if I'd written a business plan at the very beginning, it would have been rubbish. By the time I wrote a series eight to three years in, I knew exactly what I was talking about. Um, I had experienced it. I'd, you know, I'd knocked enough doors to like have conversations. So you already know, and then you also come in with credibility. Um, and you're coming with established, even for the people and partners you're talking to, because they'll all, always ask, who's this thing? What, what, what is it? You know, so I think you, you would then be able to move a bit faster in, in the new countries that you go to. So we're speaking about what factors go into mm -hmm. considering expansion, right? Um, so, for example, let's look at marketing, right? Mm -hmm. How you push your product out. Um, can you talk about how different it is getting yeah. your products in the hands of your vendors, your yeah. merchants in Nigeria versus Ethiopia, for yeah. example. Yeah. Um, and are, are there any cultural nuances you think fintech founders should consider before they approach other African markets? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and actually, it starts even with a brand, right? Um, you have to make sure that your brand is not... Um, that it translates well mm -hmm. in the market that you're markets that you're going to and how people think about it. So that's something we actually think about. Um, and and then it goes to what are the. I mean, by the way, one one thing that's really important in thinking about which countries you go to is how open that country is to foreigners, right? Um, and both from a cultural perspective, as well as just the environment, right, and how open it is. Um, and that's different from welcoming to strangers, right? Like it's like, okay, boy, foreigner owning a business, right? Like it's a different, different conception. Um, and so for us, what we've seen in Ethiopia as an example is that you need to localize a lot, right? Um, and to understand the nuances of how things work, right? Um, I'll give you one example. I went into a meeting with my, 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 um, my colleague who's the CEO of our Ethiopia business. And I came out of that meeting thinking, wow, we've got this great deal. We're going to do something with these guys. 
And he literally turned to me and was like, I don't think so. I was like, what? So he was like, give me a second. So he goes back in, spends another five, 10 minutes with the person, came, I was like, there's no deal. <laughs> and I was like, wow, I, I misread that completely, right? Like, so Nigerians, and I say this because Nigerians, I think with Nigerians, you know what you're getting, right? You know if there's something to be done or not, there's no, and if there's something done, we'll do it. Like, it's just like, it's very rare. And I think Ethiopians and, and maybe East Africans generally are maybe a bit more reserved about that and a bit more cards to the chest. So you have to learn how to read that. And I think that plays out in terms of just the day-to-day -day recruiting or, or like engaging of merchants. And I think that's why important to have a local team, right? And there's nothing wrong. It's just like how people are. Um, and so having a local team, then you can break down all of these kinds of nuances very easily. So um, staying on the conversation on partnerships and the role they play in helping fintechs yeah. expand, right? So we know that Ecobank is truly Pan-African, yes. right? How do you think banks can leverage on their Pan-African presence to help fintechs move yeah. into other regions? Yeah. I mean, I've always been a big believer that banks should not be afraid. You know, I'll use the word afraid of fintechs, um, but rather look to partner. Um, and we've seen it all over the world, right? Um, and, and I think actually as the world evolves, um, you know, banks such as Ecobank that have a large footprint around, around specific geographies are well positioned um, because, you know, they, they also have to evolve, right? And that involvement is, is even this conversation we're having, right? And saying that, you know, we're in a position to, we have regulatory relationships in all of these markets. We can actually help the regulators understand how, the, how, how technology is evolving. Um, we can play a role in what regulations actually exist. And we can open up those markets to fintechs who may be able to move faster than us in certain aspects, but still leverage our products and our, our infrastructure and what we're doing. Right. Um, there's a bank that I love in the in the U.S. called Cross River Bank. Cross River Bank has one office in the U.S., but it's I think the second le largest lender in the U.S. Um, and when you get a loan from Cross River Bank, you don't even know it because you're getting it from Cabbage, you're getting it from Blue Vine, you get it from so many different places. Um, when you get a savings account from them, you don't know because it's plugged into something else, plugged into something else, right? So, but it's the second or third largest lender in the U.S. Um, and so I think that's, and that's a completely like branchless approach. So even for banks that already have branches, already have a reach from that perspective, can still play in that sort of way and build and achieve the goals that they, they wish to achieve. So I, th I, think, I think the banks have a key role. I think that opening up is really, really important. And I think for fintechs, looking for ways to partner with the banks accelerates your move into, into multiple countries. And hopefully in some of those countries, you don't have to set up local entities, right? You can leverage and partner on licenses and things like that. Um we see so whenever Africans travel around um, the continent. Mm -hmm. So, for example, when I went to Nairobi yeah. in February, I had a hard time using. I'm not going to say yeah. which bank. <laughs> Don't want to cast them. <laughs> but I had a hard. I had Isn't so yeah. many challenges yeah. with my USD card. It wasn't yeah. a local card. Sure. So many challenges. Yeah. Same thing in Seychelles, which is yeah. a cash-heavy economy, it was so difficult yeah. to find. You know. So I mean, I know there's a role that fintechs and banks yeah. can play here, yeah. right? What do you think is blocking that? relationship from yeah. growing no look there's still a lot of work to be done on cross-border on being able to pay across borders right um funny enough i was just in i was in nairobi two weeks ago um with um daniel who was who was just on from weblogy and um and i i demoed to him doroki which is our merchant our merchant solution and i pulled up a qr code and he opened his weblogy app and scanned and paid me and it worked, right? And we're actually, we were with the Visa team and everybody was like so excited, right? It was like, yeah, this works. Cross-border can work. Now, the flip side of that, and which is funny to all of us at the time was, I then opened my Paga app to scan his QR code and it didn't work. And then I realized that, oh, we haven't opened outbound <laughs> on, our, on our scanning, but we've opened to accept, right? Um, so that's something we need to go do. Like, and but once we do that, that technology works, right? Um, and, and that's actually not difficult to do. So technology works. And I think there's still work to do around all of this stuff, right? That's just the reality. And I think that's where fintechs and banks and players like a Visa, MasterCard, 
all working together, sort of build it. Because what, what, I, what I just said there was on the visa rails across continent, right? Um, and so, so yeah, so there's more work to do. And that's why I think none of these companies should look at it that, um, you know, we should be worried or afraid. And the other thing I think for me when I think about this is that when we think about going to other countries, it's not that we're going to take everything we've done in Nigeria as we've done it in Nigeria into the other countries. You have to look at it very carefully and say, what really, what problems exist in this market that I can solve? Um, and how would I be differentiated in this market? So you have to think about that as well. Um, this is a perfect segue to one of my next questions, which was about how should fintech founders approach these new countries they want to expand into? Are they going to regulators and saying, this is a problem you have and mm -hmm. we have a solution? Or should they go in with an approach of, can you tell us what problems currently exist mm -hmm. where payments is concerned? Mm -hmm. And let's see how we could possibly come in and help. Hmm. Well, I, I mean, I think you should definitely not go in thinking I know it all, <laughs> right? And I can answer everything. Um, my experience with regulators, and I've had now the opportunity to deal with regulators in multiple countries, is to go in, first of all, before I go into the regulator, I would have done a lot of work in the market to understand, understand the market and understand where I think we can play. And then when, by the time I'm meeting the regulator, it's more, this is who we are and this is what we do. Um, what do you think and how do you think it could solve in your market? Right, like, and, and, and really use as a learning opportunity. But I think regulators are very, um, surprisingly very open. Like people like, you know, that question, I think that Isaac got asked, how, did, how, how can we contact Equibank, et cetera? I'm like, you know, the first time I contacted CBN was a phone call. I went to the website and I saw the phone number and I called. Um, you know, and between three transfers, I was in the payments department. Um, you know, and so, you know, you can, you can actually reach out to regulators and, and meet them that way. But I think going in with a mindset of learning, you, you would actually get more rather than thinking you already know exactly how it's, it's going to go. So I have one more question before we go into the Q&A session. So if you have any questions for Tayo, please send them into Slido. Um, I want to talk about lessons that you've learned mm. and... Um, if possible, if you are willing to talk about failures as well, because apparently you fintech founders don't like to share your failures. Oh, failed a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so in I think yeah. you you typically learn a lesson after you fumbled a little mm, bit, and then you're like, mm, okay, I, yeah. I did this wrong. I sure. should do it differently. So can you share some of the lessons you've learned about expansion yeah. after you took Paga out of Nigeria? Yeah. So I think I think the first one is. Um, Really, there are a few lessons. I, I, I think the first one is this idea that you have to have one, really work on having one team um, and one, you know, one, one culture, one, how everybody's treated is one and the same. It's easy to say, harder to execute on it. Um, I think when we first went to Ethiopia, and you have to remember, we acquired a business in Ethiopia. Um, they already had a way of doing things. And that was not how we were doing things in Niger in Paga, Nigeria. So building that bridge was actually took us a bit of time, right? And we've now seen the benefits of really stepping. We actually had to do like actually after like five months in, we had to like do okay, let's do a reorientation, all of us, of what's going on, right? Um, and that and since then it's been brilliant, right? So there's one Paga, we have you know we anything we're doing, everything's done everywhere. There's not a, we're doing in Nigeria, we're doing in Ethiopia. It's like, we're just, we're just one team. So I think that's really important. Um, the second, which I think when I reflect on our, our path to go to Mexico as an example, I think in hindsight, I wouldn't have said it publicly. I'd have done everything I did, but not said it publicly. Because when you say public, everybody keeps asking you about it. How about that Mexico? Oh, no. I'm like, don't ask me, like, you know, let me just be quiet and be doing, you know? So I regret saying that publicly. Um, I don't regret going to go and going after it. I think it was actually a really interesting opportunity. But when, what I learned there as well, though, is that investors, investors are like something they understand and see that they've seen before, right? So people are moving fast. They want they've never seen an African country company go to Mexico. So what's going on? I don't understand that, right? Um, and so there's still, 
And I think Migo is still like one that has done that to go to Brazil. Um, and even when I, I was actually at Kechi a couple of weeks ago and, you know, and he says, look, literally I had to get a Brazilian partner that, 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 that helped make that happen, right? So I think there's still sort of that element. And I think even in African countries, you have to think about that. Are there countries where you need a local partner to help you move forward? So as we're going in African countries, we're also thinking through that, right? Um, you know, and then, and then last but not the least, I would say, look, um, don't shy away from engaging the regulators. You need to engage them. They need to know who you are, right? Don't be in the shadows, like let them know you, let them know what you're trying to do. Whether you're regulated is another question, but like let them know what you're trying to do um, and, and, and have the conversation with them. I think that would be really, really critical. So there's a question here um, about registering a Nigerian company. So the person is asking, can a Nigerian company be used across ECOWAS member states? Um, or do, do you need to register with each regulator in each ECOWAS country? I think every country's regulation is slightly different. I don't think you can just, if you're looking to be regulated, you, you need a local entity in each country. I don't think you, yeah. I think so. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not 100 percent. She get a good lawyer. <laughs> that's, like, that's the other part of this. There, but the good thing is there are now companies like Norbase that are helping people register across across countries um, in a very fast way and open bank accounts. So I think they should also think about about that. The one thing that not to forget is the auditing, because you also now have to audit every entity, right? So every year, and they have to consolidate. So there are all of these administrative things that people skip, <laughs> like in thinking about when they go to other countries. Yeah. Would you be open to sharing this your playbook with us? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> um, <laughs> hard fought lessons. It's, so there's a question, um, and, and but I'm sharing this, elements of it. There's yes, some elements of it. Yes. Yes. Um, there's a question about why Ethiopia, and I also had a similar question about mm -hmm. Mexico as sure. well. Yeah. So why why these countries? Well, we're no more doing Mexico, by the okay, way. So, okay. just, so yeah, <laughs> that's, during the pandemic, we put that aside. Um, so we're focused on Africa. Um, look, why Ethiopia, um, aside from the, there's a huge sentimental reason, first of all, because we, Paga was built in Ethiopia. We have a, 50, a team of 50 people there. Um, so actually most of what you use was actually developed in Ethiopia. Um, that's a sentimental reason. But beyond the sentiments, look, this is the second largest country on the African continent. Um, you talked about the problems you had doing transactions. I have that all the time in Ethiopia, right? Um, it's starting from a low base. It's a massive opportunity going forward, both on the consumer side. I actually expect them, and they've been making a lot of reforms. I expect them in the next month or so to release allowing foreign companies into financial services in Ethiopia fully. So I think that's gonna be awesome. And that's gonna bring a lot more innovation into Ethiopia. They're now allowed into the merchant side, which is what we're doing. Um, yeah, so for us, it's like, there's a big opportunity for Ethiopia and we love, we love the country, but we're also going to other parts of the continent. We see it as a long game. Yeah, you, I think playing the long game is perhaps the best approach, exactly. right? Um, there's a question and I really liked it. What is PAGA not going to do? Um, mm -hmm. Because in the previous session, I think it was Gwenga Ajayi that spoke about the super fintechs. Yeah. So they start off one way and then eventually build multiple sure. products, which you've done with yeah. PAGA. Um, you have the link, the pay me link, which is directly mm -hmm. to consumers. Um, you have the integration with Twitter as well, which mm -hmm. is super great. Mm -hmm. And then you have Doroki, right? Yeah. So where are you unlikely to venture into? <laughs> we're, we're not making cars. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to space though, <laughs> we're not making cars. No, look, um, strategy is an important question because strategy is as much what you do as what you don't do. I mean, very clear about it. Um, so for example, when we talk about our platform as a service at Paga, um, we say, look, we want to empower third parties. And in doing so, we're very clear that it doesn't matter what they do. We actually don't care if you even compete with us. We want you to use our platform because you know Netflix is on is hosted on AWS. Amazon Video is probably Netflix's biggest competitor, right? But they but AWS is not going to screw Netflix up, right? Like they're hosted on AWS and they're comfortable with it. So we take that perspective. So what we will do directly ourselves is irrespective of what we power other people to do, right? Um, and and so. Our focus right now on our direct side is the consumer and the small medium business. And, and on the consumer side, we aggregate everybody. 
So we actually don't care if your money sits in Paga. You can leave your money in Ecobank. You can leave your money in Yellow PSB as they open up. You can leave your money in CUDA, whatever it is, and aggregate all your accounts into one place and do your transaction. So we, we take a very different perspective of how we go to market with consumers. Um, and then and then on the, on the small medium business side with Doroki, it's about accepting payments and digitizing those merchants, offering them financial services, accept payments from everybody, right? Uh, so we take a very open view in how we go to market. So there's a question here about um, what Paga is doing in the area of customer acquisition for banks through Paga Agent Network, and how is Paga managing competition in the agency banking space? Yeah, um, there's low competition in the agency banking space um, and increasing competition. A lot of unregulated people as well, which we need to we need to keep working on. Um, but you know, I mean, look, our view is that we just continue to build out. I mean, we now have over 120,000 agent points and that's growing really fast. Um, we've seen really good adoption of our POSs across, across the market. We now have the Paga orange terminals, um, that we, that we have out there. Um, and, you know, and so we continue to just build infrastructure and build, you know, a lot of reliability in our services and also how we serve the agents. And that's what keeps them, keeps them with us. So that's how we deal with competition. Um, on the bank side of opening accounts for banks, we actually haven't yet done that um, with banks. There remains that opportunity. Um, I think there's still just a question of like, what's the alignment for us properly on it? And I think that's something that we just, we'll, we'll figure out in time. There's a question here on your take on digital currency and mm -hmm. uh, central bank digital currency for the African continent. Love it. And I want to add to this, yeah. and because I know that a lot of Nigerian banks push for cashless economy and the CBN is as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then you have this agency banking thing, yeah. which involves an exchange of cash, of cash yeah, right? Exactly. And then we're not talking about digital currency, sure. right? Is it possible for a sort of symbiotic relationship to exist between all three? Yeah, so look at it this way, right? Um, across Africa today and Nigeria, especially cash is king, right? It's still 90 something percent of transactions are done in cash. Um, and to move to digital, you need a bridge between cash and digital, yeah. which is what our agent network does. So the people go to the agents, they're actually using cash, but the agent's using a digital platform. They've already digitized their money, right? Um, and I think that same network would work for any other form of currency, whether it's cryptocurrency, or central bank digital currency. Now, um, so I think that that relationship will exist. I think it's interesting, the central bank digital currencies, I'm a big proponent um, of crypto in general and, and central bank digital currency. Um, and I'm advising, you know, on a, I'm working with an advisor group that is doing for the US digital currency. Um, a key principle, and I fear that we may have gotten this wrong in Nigeria at the moment, a key principle, I think, for central bank digital currency to succeed is privacy. So today I have an, I have an account with Ecobank. The central bank does not know what transactions I do on that account. They can get a legal court order to get access to my records at Ecobank, but there is a process to do that. They're not supposed to have access directly, so I have privacy in my transactions. A central bank digital currency that is 100% open and visible to the central bank will not be used by the mainstream. It will be used as a settlement tool between financial institutions. And I, and I really fear that that's what we've achieved in Nigeria so far. It could be changed, but where we are today, it's going to end up being used as a settlement tool between institutions. I don't, see, I don't think it's going to go mainstream. But that doesn't exactly address the needs of the end consumers who want access to this digital currency, but maybe not be comfortable with the CBN having exactly. total access. Exactly. So I think the CBN will have to change its, its view at some point and, and ask itself, what am I really trying to accomplish? Um, if what you're really trying to accomplish is removing fiat and notes, then there's a way to do it that is protects the privacy. There, there's sort of a, CDBC um, approaches that protect privacy. And this is a big debate in the US Congress today about protecting privacy. The Indian government is doing a pilot as well. They have over 80 million people in this pilot. And the, the platform that they have chosen and that they're using 100% protects the privacy of, the, of their citizens. The Indian government cannot see their transactions, but they know every single currency that's issued and where, and, and, and where it is, but they don't know what it's being used for. Right? So they know what they've issued and have access to it. Yeah. 
Um, I have a question about um, the role education and empowerment plays, mm. right? Especially you dealing with agents, right? Mm -hmm. um, typically, commercial banks like EcoBank, for example, they probably have a lot more manpower, but fintechs tend to have a lot less. Um, how could a partnership with a bank help with training, empowering, and educating agents on how to use digital platforms that this may be their first time, you know, coming in contact with like yeah. a POS that, yeah. you know, with touchscreen and all of that. Yeah. I hadn't thought about this before. Are you suggesting that maybe EcoBank staff can help? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I mean, look, I think there's a huge education always, right? Of how do you educate people about what's going on, how it works. Um, and I think all players just play a role in doing that, um, both in terms of how we market and how we train people. Um, it's an ongoing work uh, in terms of how you do that, frankly. I don't think there's any, any short answer to the fact that you just have to do that hard work um, on a per person basis, but also some things are now mainstream enough that people know it, like people know a POS, people know a card now, right? Back in the day, people didn't know what a card was, right? Like now people know a card. Now they know not to put their pin, not to give someone their pin. There's still some of these things that people now know, um, but we keep having to train and train, train those things, right? So there are two questions about PSB license and I actually sure. really like them. So first, someone talks about MTN Nigeria recently mm -hmm. getting awarded a PSB license. Mm -hmm. And then there's a question about if PAGA has any plans to also go that route. Okay, so this is a good one. This is what we're not going to do. We are not going to apply for a PSB license. Thank you. Um, no, we're not going to do that. So that's, a, that's actually a good. Actually, I thought of that before. Um, no, so what do I think? Uh, look, I think the PSBs are a category of bank that allow for anyone, actually, mm -hmm. not just the telcos, to, to, um, to play, right? And they're set up with the idea that how do we get financial services to the most rural parts of Nigeria? That is the focus of PSBs. It's how do we get to the most rural parts of the country? You have taken your services all the way to the innermost parts of Nigeria. Let's get financial services to there, to there as well. Um, and that's why their requirements about majority of their branches and their locations being in rural areas and things like that. So I think that's good. And I'm hopeful that it will achieve the goal um, for it. I think that it has its risks as well, yeah. but I think it's overall a good thing for, for everybody. From our perspective, we look at a PSB like we look at any other bank um, in terms of partnership, in terms of access onto our platform, all that kind of stuff, yeah. Um, so there's a, someone has a question here asking you to explain the difference between like series A, B, and C. Okay, <laughs> sure. In fact, I actually wish those, those terms go away. So these are terms that are used in funding rounds of companies. Um, and typically it's literally just to denote the actual funding rounds you have. And so people start with a seed round, right? And then there's also, I mean, I guess some people say pre-seed. Okay, so pre-seed, seed round, then a series A. And a series A typically is, um, I mean, used to be when you get your first real institutional company, like QED came in, right? Like that, that kind of a company. Um, then series B, then series C is more like growth round. So, so I think it's more by series A, you've already have a product. Yes. You already have something out there. Series B, you have product market fit. Um, and you're entering the growth, starting to get to growth. Series C, you have revenue, really good revenues and you're building out. Um, and then D, they're just really names too. But I actually think we should, we should kill it. Um, uh, last month, Binance US, announced a $200 million seed round. <laughs> I was just like, come on, this is, this is ridiculous, you know? Um, that is not a seed round. Yeah, that's a, that's a seed round, actually. Like, you know, seed rounds used to be like, you know, like 100K, yeah, 50, 50K, 10. what are you talking about? Like, yeah, you know? Um, yeah, so I was like, that's not a seed round. I mean, what we've had here in Africa, Wave did a two hundred million dollar yeah. Series A round, right? Um, and 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 so that's 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 probably the biggest we've seen in Africa. So I, I think the word should just go away, and they're just like there's a funding there's round. Space. Yeah. So there's a question here about the drive behind <laughs> Paga floating in microfinance bank. Ooh, I guess this has gotten out. <laughs> <laughs> well, Secret yeah. So we out. do have we do have a we do have a microfinance bank. Um, no, look, if you look at our ecosystem, um, we have the consumer business, we have Doroki, we have the platform as a service. And across all of that, there's opportunity to do lending. 
And so that's what the microfinance bank is for. But our approach is not only that we'll do it ourselves, we'll also partner with other people to have their, their lending into our, into our platform. Um, so I wanna talk about PAGA turning 13, mm, right? And you. talk about, can we clap for PAGA? 13 years in thank the you. game. <laughs> yeah, um, can you tell us how the role of partnerships and collaboration has helped with success yeah. and even scaling multiple milestones Absolutely. to get to this point? Absolutely. Um, we would not be here without our partners. There's just no way. Um, and when I was reflecting on, on, on getting to 13 and the scale we've seen in our, in our business, um, you know, it really started with, I remember MultiChoice being our first, our first partner um, when it came to, um, you know, the first biller on our platform that we had a direct relationship with, um, InterSwitch being the first place where we went to get a lot of other billers. Um, working with GT Bank, I think was our first bank at the time, and Bolaji was, was back there then, um, you know, and then Diamond Bank was a major partner for us, actually, um, in, in being hosting everything. So like, there's so many, there's no way we would have done this without partners who along the way believed in us and have continued to partner, FCMB uh, being one of our big banks, and now Echo Bank um, on the card, on our card processing. So it's all about partnerships and, and really figuring out like, and in, in partnerships, I think the key thing for us that has been successful is going in with a view of what, what would you like to get out of this relationship? Here's what we wanna get out, here's what we think, and then where's the win-win? And being very direct and open, right? Um, and, and I actually love how Equibank approaches this stuff because I, we've really been able to just get very quickly to the heart of the matter of like, and, and really just execute. So I think that's been really good. Um, so yeah, no, we're very proud of 13 years. It's hard work. Uh, we now have 19 million users on our platform. Um, last year was the first year. Thank you. Last year was the first year we processed over 1 trillion Naira in a year. We processed, ended at 1.2 trillion. And last quarter we did 750 billion. Right, so it's moving at a really fast pace um, and it's across every element of our business. So we're really excited about that. And so we're thankful also to our customers. And, we're, and I think to me, that's engagement, right? People who are using, consumers who are using Paga on the Paga app are finding it easier to use and are just driving, driving more of it as well. So I'll ask one final question before sure. we close, which is what is Paga's approach to agent management? So you've spoken about engagement. Yes. We've yes. spoken about education. What are the factors um, going to managing, if, especially a large group of agents? Yeah. I mean, this is long, lots of work <laughs> right, to do this. We have a dedicated sales team uh, to manage our agent network. We have a 24 by, four, 24 by 7 call center um, to respond to any issues people have across any channel. Um, you know, I think ultimately it's how you treat the people. It's how you treat each engagement. Um, and that's where it's won. Um, I say to my team, when you speak to anyone, you are paga to them. The way you engage them, you are paga to them. Um, and that's, that's what they will take, take away. So I think building that relationship with agents, and we're really proud that people even talk about the agent business as the paga business, you know, like, so, so that's good, but, um, but it's that day-to-day -day engagement and building. And that's why it's hard to replicate. Um, but yeah, we're excited about it. Thank you so much, Taya. Thank you, thank much. you for sharing your thoughts yeah, with us. Um, thank you everyone yeah. um, for joining this session. Um, we're opening up to networking now. And if you haven't had a chance to eat, please go and grab a bite and then please wait a little bit and talk to more people in the room. Okay, I just want to give, I just want to thank everyone for attending the maiden edition of the Echo Bank FinTech Breakfast Series. My name is Osahan Akbata and I'm in charge of payment sales in Echo Bank Nigeria. I would like to, I hope you all enjoyed the event and I think that you might have learned something useful, I hope so. Um, the whole goal of having this event was to improve collaboration between banks and fintech firms to build a stronger ecosystem. I would like to especially thank our speakers, Tommy, Benga, Daniel, Tayo, and Isaac. I would also like to thank our partners, Tech Cabal, 
And everybody at EcoBank who made this possible with special thanks to our managing director, Bolaji. And we um, will be sending something out to every registered guest here. We'll send out a document that has information about who we are as EcoBank, what we offer FinTech firms, and how to get in contact with us. I know a number of people were asking about that. So you will receive that if you're one of the registered participants uh, of this event. So thank you all for attending. And we look forward to seeing you at our next EcoBank FinTech breakfast. So enjoy your time, interact with each other. And as the uh, moderator has said, breakfast is served. Let's prioritize our guests, EcoBank staff. Thank you. Thank you.